In the ancient Roman world, the ability to read and write was considered essential and invaluable, as it is indeed today as well. However, not everyone was trained in these skills, and so those who possessed them were able to access more varied and broad opportunities. Still, though, the ancient Roman world was filled with written expressions, ranging from graffiti to all forms of poetry, and from history to political commentary and philosophy. The works written by men and women from the ancient Roman world contain some of the most profound thinking, some of the most beautiful expressions, and some of the most evocative ideas ever written. From them we can learn not just who the Romans were, but how much we still have in common with them today. When looking at images of reading and writing from Roman frescoes, it is very significant to note how often the images are of women. Today we continue to direct attention to the inequities in education around the world, and we point to the need to support equity in education for girls. In ancient Rome, this equity still did not exist, but it was considered important for women outside of the poorest class to be educated and to be able to hold informed conversations reflecting wide reading and understanding. And so a fascinating number of images of reading and writing in ancient Rome involved women, as you can see. But how did the Romans record their thoughts in ways which have lasted for more than 2,000 years? First, consider that Roman books were different from modern ones. A Roman library would have contained scrolls like these, reflected in an ancient sculpture. They consisted of a central pole around which long sheets of papyrus were wound. Papyrus is where our word paper originates. At the ends of the pole were decorative caps which helped keep the paper wound and protected. Scrolls were also called volumina, where our term volume comes from, and they were stored in bundles because a work of literature could consist of a number of scrolls which needed to be kept together. These volumina could be stored in large baskets called capsi, such as this one, where our term capsule comes from. These caps I had handles which allowed them to be carried where needed. Or in large libraries, scrolls would be piled on shelves just like modern shelves. A tag would be attached to the end of the scroll which identified what was written on it. In order to read it, a viewer would simply need to unroll the scroll a little at a time and read the columns of writing as they unrolled, winding the papyrus onto a second scroll to keep it secure. In this picture, the book-like items on the upper right and lower left are actually wax tablets tied together with leather strips. This is where the structure of our modern book began. Things written on such wax tablets were not intended to be kept for a long time, because the wax was meant to be written on, smoothed, and then reused. These were more like modern notepads or post-its. Ink used to write on papyrus could be made from a number of substances, depending on the importance and the intended longevity of what was being written. Black ink, called atramentum, was made from soot or burnt materials like pitch or resin, made into a powder. This powder could be mixed with resin, which made it thick so that it didn't leak from the tip of the pen. This also made what was written with it able to last for thousands of years. Ink which was too thick was then diluted with water or vinegar to make it flow enough to write with. Red ink was sometimes made from powdered red lead, also mixed with resin and diluted, or it could be made from red ochre, although red ink was usually reserved for laws or for imperial decrees. The lees of wine could also be boiled down to make a deep purple ink, and sometimes the ink released by cuttlefish was collected to be used for ink. Other colors could be made from crushing semi-precious stones, and even gold was used for gilding inscriptions and for very special writing. Here you can see a reproduction of an ancient Roman scroll, which shows what a durable, practical design it had. And here's a reproduction of a wax tablet, also very practical. If you needed multiple pages, you just linked together a few of these tablets using the leather straps through holes on the side of the wood. This is essentially the same way books have been bound for centuries. They're stitching through the left side of bundles of pages, which are then bound together to make the book. Incidentally, it is no coincidence that today we use electronic tablets, which we can write on using a stylus. These terms and concepts are taken directly from the Roman world. Here you can see ink wells. You would have several, each containing a different color of ink. And you can see the structure of a stylus. There are many different types. As you can see, the way the point or nib is constructed impacts the type of writing you can do. 
A larger tip or nib is like a medium point pen or sharpie today. The two steely on the right have very fine tips. The farthest right has a split nib, which allowed the ink to travel up the split to be stored. It meant you didn't have to dip your pen quite so often. The structure of a fountain pen is exactly the same today. You can also see the eraser end of the stylus. The non-writing end has a flat structure used for smoothing out the wax already written on, so that it could be used over and over again, just like erasers we use today. Here you can see the structure of the pen close up. The split is clearly visible, and you can see that the nib was shaped from the bottom as well. By carving out the underside of the nib, you have cleaner writing with less chance of smearing the ink, and you could make the nib as finely tipped as you like. Quill pens used for millennia have been constructed in the exact same way. The ability to read and write continues to be essential to education. It allows us to share ideas, record our thoughts, and explore the possibilities of what we can envision. The Romans understood this, and they recorded their ideas, philosophies, beliefs, expressions in incredible volume. In addition, writing in Latin has been the method of recording such thoughts for more than 2,000 years, and so being able to read their physical record and to translate it for ourselves opens the door to more than two millennia of the evolution of thought. And so we are left to ponder. How can we look to the writings of the Romans in order to understand their legacy better and in order to understand how it has shaped the world in which we live today?